one to join. Yes, so good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our final expert interview this year. Um, my name is Rena Goldenberg Lynch, and together with Inga Woodstra, we're the co founders of the Big Fish Diversity and Inclusion um, Academy with uh, the nice poster behind me and, and Inga as well. Today, we are going to talk about how to break barriers on ethnicity in the workplace. And it proved to be a, quite a popular topic. We have now, as of today, this morning, 128 people signed up, which is why we're recording this, because not everyone I expect uh, will come um, to the session, but many will uh, watch it afterwards as a recording. Um, really delighted to have our guest speaker today, Nadine Dyer of Deloitte. Say hello. Hi, Nadine. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. A number of you may have already met Nadine before. I am a big fan, and <laughs> so I ask her to come and talk at various events um, and opportunities. So, um, yes, just just the, how do we run this uh, uh, expert interviews? What we do is it's a conversation, really. Um, you will see that we will ask you to contribute with your questions, with your comments. Uh, most of this is going to happen in the chat. So feel free to contribute in the chat. I also have a couple of polls that we will run uh, throughout the session. Um, Inga is going to monitor the chat today. We alternate who's hosting. Um, I'm hosting today. So Inga is going to monitor this, the, the chat and then we'll contribute with your questions and comments as we go through the session today. So no slide presentation, just a conversation. And um, uh, as much as we can, we want to learn from Nadine's experience um, in inclusion and diversity at Deloitte and more broadly. So let's get started then. Oh, Inga, hi, you want to say something? Yeah, I'd like to introduce the Big Fish Academy. Is that all right? Ah, thank you. <laughs> so who are the Big Fish Academy? We started, Rena and I started last year with the Big Fish Academy. Both of us have a long experience in diversity and inclusion. And we are increasingly feeling that a lot of the people that we were working with in organizations that work in diversity and inclusion um, felt a bit overwhelmed really by the amount, there are so many different areas you need to know about disability, neurodiversity, um, black people, Asian people, women, you know, it is a lot, the, the agenda is massive. And a lot, in, whereas when I started 10 years ago, it was, yeah, it was, everyone was experimenting. Now there's actually a lot of research backing up what works and what doesn't work. And we wanted to help those people, people like you, that want to know how to drive diversity and inclusion, package everything that we know and that we read up on in helpful formats so you can stay up to speed really quickly and don't have to do all that research and reading all the literature, make it really easy for you. And that's where the Big Fish Academy came in. And we've had, uh, yeah, at our events, typically over 100 people sign up. So clearly there is a, a real need for this. So we're uh, after our first year, we're definitely continuing next year. So, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, next year um, at, towards the end of the program. We have about an hour um, and we will uh, endeavor to finish on time. And at the end, if you have any burning questions that you still want to ask of Nadine, uh, stick around for, we'll be on about for 10, 10 minutes over time for those of you who um, like to come up at the end of the session if, we're, if this were a face-to-face -face session. Let's get started. Nadine, I'm really excited uh, for you to be here and I wonder if you could give us a little bit of an introduction of your journey at Deloitte and, and more broadly. Well, thank you, Rina. Thank you, Inga, for um, inviting me along today. Um, so about me, so I am a Respect and Inclusion Manager within our financial advisory service line within Deloitte. I've been in, in the inclusion space within the past, I would say, two to three years. Um, so within financial advisory, I look after all things inclusion, um, working with our financial advisory executive, the firm-wide talent team, our FA recruitment and learning teams to drive inclusion and diversity. I'm also the co-chair of our multicultural network and been the chair for the past three years. Um, so yeah, so all things inclusion, I, I'm passionate about and, and I do within, within the firm. 
And I think I've been following uh, Deloitte and working uh, with a, a number of different people at Deloitte, um, uh, probably across throughout two or three years as well, Nadine. And one of the things that I want to share with you is um, a video that uh, they put together for, uh, for initially for Deloitte for uh, internal consumption, but it went, um, went uh, absolutely wild and people are all across, so you've released it publicly and it was available, was picked up by Walmart in the US and many of you may have already seen it, um, but it really summarizes quite well um, how Deloitte feel about diversity and inclusion. So I'll play it for you here. Oh. So it's quite powerful and I really enjoy it. I know a number of you have seen it before. So let's get stuck in then. Um, I want to lay a little bit of a, of, a, of a landscape for you in terms of the, the, the BAME representation. And today we are talking about ethnic minorities, which are all grouped into this label BAME. And I want to ask you, Nadine, about that just um, in a minute. But uh, in terms of... Um, representation in the UK. I've just looked up these figures and uh, looking at just the very top posts of organizations and um, uh, companies, private companies, public companies, we are currently at about 4.7% of top level jobs being held by uh, people of BAME backgrounds. And that is compared to a uh, population of 14% in the UK. 
So about 51 out of uh, over a thousand jobs are held by people of BAME background. Um, now, if we look a little bit closer, um, uh, in terms of BAME women, only 1% of top jobs are held by BAME women. And when you break it down to black women in particular, only 0.3% of the top jobs in the UK are held by black women. And men and women together, only 1.5%. So that's 16 out of over 1,000 jobs are held by black men or women. So, you know, one of the questions was about whether barriers do exist and the data suggests that they certainly do. But before we ask you that, Nadine, I do want to ask you about BAME and, and that, that label. And I know a number of organizations have started to shift away from it. Have you done that? Have you looked at that at Deloitte? Yes, we, we started to, we, we recognize, and I think we've, we've always known that you cannot just group all ethnicities and in, into one big group, right? Um, so we have started to move away slowly from that term BAME mm -hmm. and really look at each individual um, ethnic group as it should be. Because as we know, you know, an Asian man's experience is completely different to that of a black woman. So, so we are recognizing that there are differences. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, we look around and we can see, you know, the lack of diversity in, in certain areas. So, so we are definitely trying to move away from the BAME term. And does that, that mean when, you, when you're saying you're moving away from it, does that also mean that you're now starting to collect data in the various subgroups of that category? Yes, yes. So we, we've always collected data um, mm -hmm. and we've also, we've all, always collected data on um, race in regards to black, Asian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have always had had that data, but we had used the term BAME very, you know, frequently. And I mean, I won't. I mean, it's still being used, but we are trying to to move away from that term. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, for for purposes, and I, and I think this is the reason probably uh, the term is used um, to make it simpler for people. Um, okay. So, and because we're talking about ethnic uh, minorities more generally, I might come across this uh, term um, in 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 this session. Um, but let's talk about this question of barriers. Uh, are there really barriers for people of BAME backgrounds in the workplace? What do you think? This is a, a really good question, Rena. I guess, you know, are there barriers for people from an ethnic minority? Now, some people would say, no, you know, there's no barriers, it's fair, it's equal, um, and no barriers e exist. However, when we look around our working environment, we can see with our eyes <laughs> that there's not, it's not as diverse as it should be. You know, we speak with our colleagues and people that we work with, and we hear about the issues and the barriers that they are facing. The research suggests as well, there've been countless you know, papers and research and studies um, over the past few years around the barriers that people from an ethnic minority background face. Mm -hmm. So the answer there is yes, there are barriers within the workplace that black and Asian minority ethnic individuals do face. Yes, and I, I would agree with you. The data is quite clear, uh, so I think there must be. But what are they? Do you have any any sort of thoughts on what they could be and 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 how to start breaking them down? Yeah, so I, I would say that there are a few um, barriers that Black and Asian minority ethnic people face within the workplace. The first being, I would say, is development opportunities. So if you are from a Black or Asian minority ethnic background, you are less likely to be given those stretch projects, those exciting projects where you can really showcase your skills and your attributes. Um, and this is what this is what's happening is that those opportunities are not always being afforded to this group. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore they're not getting the development skills, they're not getting the opportunity to showcase their skills. And that's where you, you come to um, the middle. Um, where you see people being stuck um, at the middle, um, at middle manager level. Um, and then the progression piece um, then comes okay. into play. And then what you do have is that a knock-on effect because people are not progressing, um, you don't have um, role models at the top. Okay. Um, and then people look up, don't see anyone else that looks like them. 
and feels like, well, I, I'm not going to be able to progress here. And then you see people leave, right? So it's a, it's a kind of knock-on effect. So um, that, that's one of the key barriers. And I would say organisational culture okay. um, is another barrier as well. And it's the things that happen, you know, everyday systemic um, things that happen that all, are also barriers um, to our Black and Asian minority um, ethnic colleagues within the workplace as well. So th those are, I think, the two key ones, well, as well as the role models as well. Yeah. Do you have yeah. some examples of those everyday things, Nadine, that you're so talking about? Yeah, sure. So it could be microaggressions or things such as, um, as I said, you know, not being given the, the opportunities on, on stretch assignments, being put on a, a performance plan um, when you shouldn't be, but because there's some kind of difference, um, people are, 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 are sometimes um, marginalised and singled out. Um, so those are a few examples. And I want to hear also from, from, from you in the audience whether you've experienced any, any uh, barriers in, in, your, um, in your career. So if we can launch the first poll, Inga, um, and the first poll has two questions, if you don't mind, so that we have a fair comparison. So first, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about what your ethnic background, um, and then the second question just below it is, do you feel that you have encountered any invisible barriers in the progression of your career, um, which is a, a result of your background? Um, and it'll be very interesting to see uh, in our audience what people um, think. And let's see, so people are voting. We're about 50% through, keep voting. Yeah, and because we wanted to draw some broad brush conclusions, there's some very wide categories here, right? So yeah, let's just see where you uh, fit best, how you describe yourself. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's impossible to capture everyone, unfortunately. Um, didn't put down any Europeans down here. <laughs> so you're oh, that's all, that's white. all white. Like, you're I, all white. It's all, it's either, Europeans are white, black, or Asians, or Chinese. Or, yeah, so yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but go ahead. So we're about 80% now. Uh, let's see, just a few people are still voting. So I think um, it's yeah, not everyone like... can vote, right? If yeah. you're mobile, you won't be able to vote. So sorry about that. Feel free to comment in the chat, though, if you. Want to be included? You can be, right? You can just say in the chat, yes, and this has been my experience. We'd love to hear from you because you can do that on your mobile. So let me end the polling and launch our results. Oh, so yeah, I've just done that. Go ahead and share then. Yeah, yeah. So, so about 46% of our audience is uh, uh, white. 36% black and then we have well, that was very high right obviously it's a topic that interests black people a lot which yeah makes sense right yeah yes exactly and here's um the interesting data so yes up 64% have said that you have experienced some sort of a um invisible barrier 21% says no and and 14% are unsure that's fair enough. But the interesting uh, bit about this data is that um, we have a total of about 80% um, between white and black and 64% have said that they have experienced uh, a, a, an invisible barrier. So that's the other thing that I'd like to point out that may maybe it's something that um, white people have experienced as well, perhaps. If well, you, you mentioned do... gender as well, or age, right, Rina? So that includes almost everyone. Or yes, all that's right. It's within those categories, yes. I presume. Yeah. So if you have, if you want to share your experience, um, and uh, if you if you want in the um, Chat. chat box that would be fantastic and then we can bring it up is there anything there now inga to share yeah yeah some uh a question but also someone jackie flynn saying i've twice experienced being the token person to be promoted employed be interesting to hear your response about that nadine being the token person is that something you recognize and mm, is that yeah is that good or bad um yes yeah, so and I, I know individuals who who feel that way thanks jackie for sharing um, and, and I guess you can take it in, in, in two ways. You know, we do have to start somewhere in terms of building up our pool of um, diverse talent. 
Um, but then in the same breath, you know, you don't want to be the only, the, be seen as I'm being chosen just because of the color of my skin, right? Nobody wants to be that, that token. But, but then like saying that, I, I, I feel like you've been chosen for a reason, not just, you know, because of the color of your skin, you've been chosen because you're obviously capable of doing your job. Um, so I think you should try and look at it in a positive light rather than a, a negative. But I mean, you never, you, you know, yeah, look at it in a positive light, I would say. Yeah, then we've got um, uh, a great question. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Inge, just one second on that, because I, I totally agree with you, Nadine, and I, ha I have this comment come back to us a lot uh, from women, so women feel that way as well, you know, women of, of different uh, backgrounds, and uh, and my, my view is that, you know, the diversity that you bring to the table is something that is of importance to the mm, business, exactly. so it's not, so, so I think, don't think of it as you're the token person, that's not what it's about, you're actually bringing something additional that exactly. is not already there when yeah. you're being appointed. And I think that's a very important point to, to keep in mind when you're being mm. promoted and you feel like you're, you're, being, you, you're the token. It's, there is no such thing, I don't think. Yeah, um, and, yes. and they're role yeah. models for, for other people in the organization, yeah. right, as well, so. Yeah. yeah. Then so go got, ahead again. Uh, yeah, more in the chat. A lot of black, Asian and minority people have to go self-employed or the entrepreneurial route. Uh, because they feel excluded or they feel they can't progress, I'm assuming Peter means. Then Fayola saying, I've and thanks for sharing, right? I've unfortunately been affected by the angry black woman stereotype. Mm -hmm. A white colleague and I did a test over a few months. We'd say the exact same thing in meetings and she'd be seen as helpful, whereas I was accused of being hostile or overly critical. That's so mm -hmm. interesting, right? So can Nadine, I'd love to hear your your um, viewer experience of that, that the angry black woman stereotype and whether yeah. you, you have done anything in your um, uh, role, anything about that or other stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, this label, it, <laughs> I don't know what to oh, say. Know. It, it's just annoying, isn't it really? But I mean, I pers I can talk from my own personal experience, right? I mean, I hear the label being banded around and stuff. I know it's there and people use it. And, and, and for me, I think they use it to silence you, um, to put you on, you know, in the back. And I, and I, and I for one, I, I just don't um, entertain it at all. <laughs> put, it, put it that way. Yeah. You know, if you want to see me, you have to have some, give me a reason as to why you feel like, you know, I'm being aggressive, you know, in, in what sense? Just, is it because I'm expressive with my hands? You know, what, it, what is it? Um, so I don't take on what what yeah people say in, in that yeah. regard. Yeah. I I think we have to use um, that label um, just to make sure that our voices are heard um, and use it in a positive way. Um, but but don't take it on. You can't take on other people's stuff. Yeah, I think there is some responsibility on organisations to to also keep an eye on the usage of certain labels yeah. and make sure that um, it's clear that it's unacceptable to use some of them. Definitely. Use all of them really, yeah. Yeah. So, so let, let's move on then. So a lot of, a number of people said here uh, that they, they don't actually see barriers or they don't see their barriers. Is, is, what is that? Is it something around the, the white privilege, the idea of because you're privileged, you, you don't know what it's like to be somebody else. And, and how do you address that, Nadine? Yeah, I, and I, I think, you know, it's very easy for other people, or should I say the majority white individuals, not to see those invisible barriers. I mean, why would they? It's like, for example, I'm, you know, an able-bodied person. How do I know what it's like to be disabled or be in a wheelchair, right? Unless I have a conversation with a disabled person, maybe go on the tube with them to understand the barriers that they face, et cetera, et cetera. So unless you are involved in the conversation, speak with the individuals, they wouldn't see the barriers, right? Um, and is it because of white privilege? Well, what, what is white privilege? So it refers to the unquestioned and unearned set of advantages, um, entitlements, benefits, and choices bestowed on people solely because they are white. So generally white people who experience such privilege do so without being conscious, right? So I guess it is white privilege, right? You don't have to think about it. 
you don't have to think about it. So um, what can be done about it? There's lots of things that, that can be done. And I think the first thing is all around education. Mm -hmm. um, once people start to educate themselves on why are we here today? Why, why are we in this situation? It, it starts to enlighten you a bit more. Um, and, I, and I think that's the, the key. And what we've done at, at Deloitte is, so after the George Floyd killing, we had a um, Let's Talk session hosted by the MCN, our multicultural network. And we had this session really just, just to hear from colleagues as to what their experience is like. How are they feeling after the George, George Floyd killing? So we put this invitation out and we expected, you know, to have maybe, um, you know, 50 or so people join. Um, we had 900 individuals across the firm join this session. And during this session, we heard from our black colleagues about what it's like just to be black in the UK. And I think what was so impactful during that session is that we had our white colleagues on the call listening for the first time about what we go through as, as black individuals. Mm -hmm. And that was the shift mm -hmm. because after that call, we had so much engagement from our white colleagues saying, oh my God, I didn't know about this. What can I do to help? How do we change the situation? It's so unfair. And I think having that open dialogue and conversation started the whole education process. And from that, you know, we, we put in mandatory training. There are conversations going on across the firm around race. And, you know, we devised our black action plan because of it. So just by having the dialogue, um, yes, it's uncomfortable, but we've got to talk about it. It's as simple as that. And I think talking about it is the first step to, 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 to change in the dial. Yeah, absolutely. And and this this idea that it is uncomfortable, I think um, I, I've heard it said before, and I completely agree that um, we got to get used to being uncomfortable, be, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. That's really yeah. the only way for us to start breaking the barriers and understanding what it feels like to be in somebody else's shoes who is so mm. different from ourselves. So I absolutely agree. And I think it's great that uh, companies can facilitate that. What else can organizations do? Have you had any experience with your organizations um, to, to address um, those types of barriers? Um, Nadine, any, any, anything specific that you've done beyond the conversation at Deloitte? Yeah, so following the conversations, well, we're still having the conversations all the time, um, but we've introduced mandatory training. So um, we put in mandatory training that looks at, you know, microaggressions, um, unconscious bias, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And our deadline was by the end of November, the whole firm, the whole 20,000 people should have wow. that mandatory training. So and that how was that? Um, how did that go? I think we're like 80, 85% there. There's a few people that need to complete their, <laughs> complete their training. Yeah. Um, and then following that, those, that training, we are having ongoing conversations. So groups are coming together, teams are coming together to, to speak about what do they learn, you know, how are they going to start changing behaviours, etc. So the dialogue is still continuing. Mm -hmm. The other piece is for our leaders. So within Deloitte, we have partners who are our senior leaders within the firm. Mm -hmm. And what we have done is put in training for our directors and partners around race. Mm -hmm. So they have a two hour session with an external provider who comes in and in small groups of five or six, they are having really deep conversations around race, mm -hmm. a safe space for them to ask the questions, mm -hmm. to get the answers um, and to be more open, because I think that is the, the bit where people are uncomfortable yeah. especially our leaders they yeah. don't know what to say how to approach yeah. it what's the best yeah. app, you know what to do so yeah. all yeah. of our leaders are going through this training at the moment um, and this is to be completed by June and it's happening now um, so so that's another piece of it sorry Inga <laughs> that's right no no finish your uh, we got some questions around that so I thought I'll bring them in straight away you, you mentioned the microaggression session, right? That over 80% of people have now done. The question was, how was it run? And I'd also like to know, how was it? Was it like a virtual training? Was it a one hour training? Did yeah. you have external people involved? And then yeah, the next so question, which I'll add to, 
um, did you get a lot of resistance about the mandatory part? Okay, so it's been run by an external provider virtually. Um, so it's an online um, session. Mm -hmm. We have done um, in-face sessions before, but this one was because we wanted to roll it out to everyone as soon as possible. Um, it was done online um, via an external provider. Um, in terms of resistance, uh, well, it's mandatory. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, although some people haven't yet completed it, but I'm sure everybody will complete it um, and will, yeah, have to do their training. So is there a lot of, yeah, especially to mandatory training, you typically do get people grumbling about that. Are you aware of any of that? I haven't heard any anything in terms of grumbles. I guess the only measurement is the, the completion rate. Um, but I know everyone's very busy, so hopefully we will make sure that everybody does their training. Yeah, and then how comfortable do senior leaders feel about those conversations about race? Did it take them a while to open yeah. up and ask questions? People can be fearful of saying the wrong thing, says Isabel. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, and I think from the Let's Talk session that we had, because it was so emotional, people were, you know, there, there was tears, people were crying. It was, it was really deep. And, you know, I had partners contact me and say, I've been in the firm, you know, 20 plus years, and this is the most impactful session I've been to. Mm. It was that deep. Um, and I think from that session, people became a bit more open about speaking about it, um, a bit more um, relaxed about saying black, you know? Um, so, and, and I had partners come to me and say, wow, I you know, didn't know, what can I do? Um, so having the conversation has opened up the dialogue and I think you know some people say you know it's still you know it's not comfortable talking about it but because we say it's, we're speaking about it every day it's part of the norm now and everyone's speaking about well how's the black action plan going you know it, it's it's part it's becoming BAU now it's not you know this scary subject that we can't approach it is now becoming part of our everyday life in Deloitte mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and who was your external provider someone asked clearly oh you, yes uh, um I so we were using John and Michi for our partners and directors and then Bina Candola um is we use for our mandatory training for all, yeah. Our, yeah. for all our staff yes so, yeah and I'm what kind of things were shared in that impactful session that that why yeah that made it so the let's talk session yeah mm -hmm. So, so, so example, my, my co-chair, Jim, he shared, you know, how he's been stopped by the police. He had like, you know, was at a petrol station and, you know, he had had nearly six police officers then, he's, you know, approach him. And he shared how he felt in that situation. We had individuals speak about, you know, being followed around in a shop, you know, just shopping, just the everyday things that black individuals face, uh, you know, if you're walking as a black man, you know, somebody crosses the road, just everyday life that black people go through. Yeah, um, I had yeah. Um, uh, just in, 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 a, in a friend's circle, I spoke to a friend of mine who is from South Africa, and she said that, that they bring up the boys there to always make sure that their hands can be seen at all times, because if they Held, hold their hands behind their back or in their pockets there's a danger that this could be misinterpreted so you can imagine what that means you know mm. growing up with with that kind of behavior in mind whereas most of us wouldn't necessarily think about that so exactly. that's another example yeah so you know and, and I think it's great that we're doing uh, you're doing all the training and the talking um, do you have any idea or sense for what's next on that you know what, what will happen yeah so so following the conversations well I'm still having the conversations ongoing training the one thing that we have implemented is our black action plan so this is the plan that has been put together by myself, three other individuals came up with the plan. We put this forward to our, our, our CEO, our deputy CEO. They are fully behind it. And it has been rolled out across the firm, clear targets as to what, what we want to achieve in terms of our partnership, um, we want, what we want to do in terms of contributing to wider society, 
how we want to make sure that our individuals, our black colleagues thrive and succeed within, within Deloitte. So, and I should share the link. I don't know if you've got that, Rena, you can share that with the audience. Yeah, um, well, yeah, the Black can, Action Plan. Yes, yeah, so they can have a look at that. So that's, that's one of the things that we are focused on right now um, within Deloitte. Um, and it's, as I said, it's becoming BAU. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm toying with the idea whether to ask you this or not, because um, th there's obviously a lot of emphasis on ethnicity right now. But then uh, in terms of the the um, the way that you and Deloitte address it, it's it's you're looking at it from a respect and inclusion perspective rather than, say, diversity. Um, and how so so is there also another part that that is going on simultaneously addressing or continuing to address the inclusion bit so it's important for us to understand how uh, a, a black uh, person feels and and what their experiences are so that we can uh, accommodate that and understand that better at the same time what about being more tolerant or taking on the responsibility yourself to educate yourself better you know all of that part of what i call inclusion yeah you do still continue to do a lot on that as well yes very much so um so you know across the firm so within the firm we have you know 11 diversity networks or of globe that look at the lgbtq plus um we have our faith networks etc but inclusion is something that we we always continue, even though we've got the Black Action Plan. So we, we still continue to look at our gender balance, which is very much a priority, looking at neurodiversity, looking at the LGBTQ plus um, community and what we can do there. So there are various think tanks as well within the firm who address inclusion as a whole as okay. well. And, and that continues alongside yeah. everything else. It's not just because we've got the Black Action Plan that everything else falls away. Yeah. we are still very much continuing our the rest of inclusion as well and that's the point that i wanted to bring out because there's a lot of emphasis on something and i don't want it to 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 seem as like a trend and everybody jumps on the bandwagon and talking about that but then we forget about the fabric exactly. that we need to have in place in order to make it all count um, yeah. so it's important to maintain those other actions plans and 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 um and and, and culture change actually mm. I know there have been a couple more questions, Inge. Did you want to uh, highlight anything? Yeah, question a while ago, actually, from someone who said, uh, I do see uh, yeah, uh, a lot of unconscious bias happening and mm -hmm. I don't get promoted as quickly as other people, but how do I even talk about this without being accused of putting the race cart and everything that comes with that? Any suggestions there, Nadine? Yeah, it, it's difficult and, and I think, you need to find someone who you can confide in, um, someone that you can trust. Um, as the chair, I get a lot of individuals come to me on a one-to-one -one and, and share their thoughts, feelings, what they're going through, their experiences. And I, I can take that as the chair and collectively go to, you know, Dimple, our, our deputy CEO, and go to the top and say, right, um, this is an issue <laughs> I've heard from X amount of people that this is the experience. Um, so, and, and I, so I think the first step is to find that trusted person that you can go to, um, to have that conversation as to find out what's the best way to navigate that because it will be different for, for everybody as to how, how to go about, um, yeah, dealing with that issue. Yeah. And then Alan is sort of saying, it, it, it feels a bit I'm summarizing here that people from ethnic minorities have to be actively involved at the law to educate mm -hmm. white people. Um, yeah, is, yeah is, isn't that a bit too much to expect? Isn't there that responsibility to educate themselves? How yes, do you see that, maybe? this is a very good point and one that's been brought up a lot. And a lot of my black colleagues are, you know, very much involved and want to help, but then some of them get burned out and go, well, you know, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. <laughs> Which is, which is fair, you know, why are we doing this? And then um, I guess because our white colleagues are very much on board as well, um, what we have done is set up an allies community within our multicultural network. So this is led by our, our white colleagues um, and it's a safe space for them to educate themselves around race, 
to have discussions, open discussions with themselves as well around, you know, what they're doing, how they can be active allies. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so really, it, it's not it's not all on the black colleagues. We are asking our white colleagues, and they are stepping up as well um, to take the lead and to to educate themselves as well, sharing resources, having the conversation. So, so that's one way that we are we are um, doing that. Um, so it's yeah. not all on black colleagues to do it. Yeah, well, it's good to to highlight that. Yeah, then Joyce is saying, DNI policies and trainings are mostly top heavy. In lower and middle managements, often these are just box ticking, box ticking exercises, sadly. How do the upper management evaluate the effectiveness of their policies and trainings when ethnic minority staff could not really speak out due to fear of judgment and retaliation from their white colleagues and managers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not sure if this relates specifically to Deloitte, so it, I, I have the sense it's more of a wider question. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's, again, it's around how you, the, the dialogue has to start. And, and I think for us, because we have got the backing of our top, our CEO, deputy CEO, behind this, um, saying that this is what we're going to do. Um, you know, we're gonna have the conversations, we're gonna have the training, we're gonna, we've got these targets in place. Um, there's not really, a, no one can't really hide. <laughs> um, and it, as I said, it is, it's becoming, business as usual so um you are going to be expected to you know if you haven't hit your target well, why why you, haven't you not hit the targets etc you know why isn't so and so being um promoted and looking really deep into the data and questioning um you know and, and i do that as part of my role i go well what's happened why is there such a difference between x and that person what what's going do we need to look at that a bit deeper and, and it's like, how, it, your conversations nadine isn't it Exactly. You go and ask those people, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Challenge and that, them, yeah. Yes, challenge them, challenge, exactly. And yeah. that's what DNI professionals do, that's what we do. Like, we want everyone to be included and have a fair and mm -hmm. equal opportunity. So you do have yeah. to ask those questions. Yeah. And, it, and as I said, it should be for DNI professionals, those individuals who are in that role to be doing that. It shouldn't just be, you know, the the average employee. It should be DNI leaders stepping up and going and questioning. You know, yeah. this doesn't look right. Why not? And what we're going to do about it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. And that sort of addresses Peter's comments, who says um, sometimes CEOs have a black, Asian, or a minority ethnic personal assistant, and then state they are diversity positive. The equal opportunity policy is locked away in a filing cabinet somewhere. And Sagar is confirming your point as well, saying yes, what we are doing too is working with data to show the breakdown of ethnicity at each level of the organization very data let so you can start discuss that exactly. opportunities point in a very neutral way right without pulling the race card and you can start those conversations that you're having Nadine so they're confirmed exactly the, da the data is key I mean when we use that that vain term right it, it looks great it looks okay it looks okay and then when you break it down to the black and the Asian, <laughs> then you see the big difference. And that's why you go, you, you cannot use that vain term and, and just um, group everyone together because the difference, it's, the data is there. You can see the difference that the black experience yeah. is much more different to the Asian experience, you yeah. know? We, we had a session on data uh, a few months ago um, and, and that was driven home then as well, how important it is to, to what type of data to collect and also what to do with it um, and to in increase the uh, the participation. It's not just by declaring your ethnic background, but obviously also other invisible uh, data that, that's important to mm. know. And uh, it depends on how active your company is in making sure that people know what is being done with the data yes. to uh, yeah, motivate people to, to declare. Is that something that you share widely at Deloitte, the information that you get, collect? We don't, we don't share it widely, but at a macro level, you can, we can pull our data and share it with the organization. You know, this, is where, this is what we look like. Um, so it, it doesn't go into the detail, you know, GDPR, et cetera. So we, yes, we use yes. it in, in, the, in the correct way, yes. And you communicate what you're going to do with it, with the data, and how you're going to use it. Exactly. To improve. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So everyone, yeah. it's it's um regular comms going out, regular yeah. webinars, just to update everyone on, on what we are doing, where we are. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. I want to turn to recruitment now, recruitment, retention, promotion, which is um, a big part of it, because we we often hear recruiters, um, both in-house and externally say that, you know, yeah, that's fine. You've asked me to ha- to, to bring you a minority ethnic um you know, executive, but there are none out there. I've looked everywhere and I can't find them. What What do you say to that? How do you respond? They're out there. They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> Go back. You know, I, I, I do get frustrated, you know, when I, when I hear yeah. that the talent's not there. It's like, you just haven't looked. Um, and, 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 and that's what it is. You haven't looked and talent is there. So go mm-hmm. and find it. Is that about looking in the right places, though, Nadine? Well, I mean, there there are various um, Bain specific recruitment companies, you know, using our networks, etc. Um, so there there are various ways that we can attract talent, and and I think it's very lazy of some of our um, HR professionals just to say, oh well, I can't I can't find any talent out there. It's not there. It's it's, it's um. And that speak when when I when I hear that I feel like, you know, uh, do they get it? Are, are they on the right page? Are they should they even be in the right in this role if they're saying they can't find the talent? Um, it's quite disturbing. Um, but the talent's there. Um, using your networks, using the the, the various fame recruitment agencies are out there. Um, there's various ways that you can attract the talent. Yeah, I think there's a big point here about, you know, if you if you want to change, you have to change your processes. You know, you're exactly. not going to attract a different exactly. audience exactly. if you continue to do what you've always done. You know, exactly. so so it's about, you know, uh, breaking it up a little bit and starting over. But with yeah. recruitment, how, how, how would you do that? I mean, we're doing little things like, for example, with um, our recruitment team, I've said, OK, well, share the job roles with you know, myself and other black and Asian minority ethnic colleagues, and let's share it on LinkedIn. Let's post mm-hmm. it ourselves. We've got our networks. So that's the way we can we can do that. Okay. Um, you know, obviously attract going to, you know, for graduates, et cetera, going to different universities, you know, the non-Russell group universities, et cetera. But it's about around um, thinking outside the box mm-hmm. um, and, and using, you know, our black colleagues, our Asian colleagues, um, using our, our networks. Um, that we have um, to, to bring in and attract the talent. As you said, Rena, we can't just keep doing the same same thing and expect a different result. And it is actually surprisingly easy to expand your pool of candidates and get the candidate type that you want. Um, if, if you if you start thinking, like you say, out of the box and a bit. Uh, and there are experts uh, who help people do that on the recruitment side as well. Um, before we go on to retention and promotion, Inga, questions? Yeah, well, actually, and I, well, sort of a question, yeah, actually, but also someone sharing, Natasha sharing, it's very interesting how companies are dealing with this. My company has been having courageous conversations being left by the board on global town halls. We're now moving, moving towards courageous actions led by external leaders, How, which I assume is like a consultancy or However, I look at my partner's company and they've only just put a black Asian minority ethnic group together. And my partner and other black colleagues feel is very much diluted. And so no one in the organization wants to speak out. They feel like they always have to challenge and therefore they expect these initiatives to run out of steam. How can companies with no experience, uh, with no black senior leaders move forward when they haven't gained the trust in their organization? Mm. Any thoughts for uh, this person's partner and yeah, what they can do in their company? Or yeah. maybe other listeners might well be in those places where they don't have the enlightened senior leaders. Yeah, it's it's yeah. I guess we, we've been I've been lucky at Deloitte. We have got those people that are behind us. Um, I would say you need to find find those those allies, those those white individuals who who do get it, who are allies, and who, who want to make a difference. And you need to. Ha- have the relationship with them, have a conversation with them and use those individuals to help you to get to the top, I think, um, to drive, to start driving the change. Um, yeah. I mean, it, 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 yeah, sorry. No, no, it's it's absolutely. I, I was just going to add whether you know this is also a conversation around around the business case, which you know I, I would like to think it's no longer necessary to make it because it's been made so many times and it's widely available everywhere. Yeah. 
Um, but I still have clients w where I do have to make the business case uh, with the senior leadership. So, and that that's the starting point. And um, mm. I, th I think from there you can start moving in the right direction as well. It's nice, Nadine, that you don't have to do deal with that anymore. <laughs> Deloitte is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And then Dara Linney saying, agree to everything Nadine is saying. There's talent out there. It's about how resourceful you can be. We use networks, and I assume she means sort of, yeah, black networks of black women or networks of Asian people or networks at universities for BAMEs people. We use sources and proactively seek talent. Um, it is also important, she makes that point, to support that talent because they may, yeah, and I'm adding here from my own experience, they may not have the social capital that other people have. Um, so helping them when they do enter an organization that is not diverse, because being the only one also is, is yeah, difficult, right? So that, uh, yeah, just to add that. Is, and is that what you do, Nadine? Do you Sorry, say that again, Inga. Yeah, do you support people with different backgrounds once they come in? Yes, yeah. So as I said, we have various networks that people can come to in a safe space and, and um, be supported. We also have um, various programs. So we've got the our new Emerging Leaders program for our Black and Asian minority talent for our senior and director levels to go through um, um, Emerging Leaders program. So looking at um, confidence and resilience, um, stakeholder, and, and having sponsorship as well from a, a partner as well. So we have various programs, not just for our BAME, but also for our, our female talent as well within the firm. So can I just ask you a question about that? Because I was going to move on to that next anyway. Um, in terms of, you, you know, you mentioned earlier, it's about making sure that that um, people of ethnic backgrounds have the same fair opportunities to progress. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned is an emerging leaders program for mm. uh, Black, uh, Asian and minority ethnic individuals. How is that perceived? Because I, I can imagine it, it could be a two-edged sword in terms of running yeah. that program. What have been some of the views? Okay, so, I mean, for a number of years, we've had a gender balance, our women in leadership program. Um, and there hasn't been much noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so when we've come up with our, um, our BAME, uh, our Black and Asian Minority Emerging Leaders program, Today, I, ha I haven't heard too many rumblings. Um, so, so far, so good. I haven't had any. I, I, I know that there have been maybe one or two, but not, not anything of, of any um, substance that have said, you know, I think people understand why we're doing this. Okay. And I think from listening to the Let's Talk sessions, going through the training, having the constant conversations, people get that it's not an equal playing field. And that we do need some interventions to start making a change. Um, and that's why we're not getting as much noise as you might as, yeah. as you expect. And, but I can imagine, so this is a view that has been voiced for female leadership programs, for instance, where mm. the women might say, well, why do we need leadership training. training? We're good enough as we are. Why is it, yes. you know, so would people of ethnic minorities not maybe feel that way as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And some people do feel that way. Like, why am I being, I mean, I'm fine. I don't need to go on a, a program, et cetera. Especially uh, for me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, but on the whole, I must say, even if I think about the hundred ladies that I have on the gender balance program, not one of them has said, you know, why have I been put forward? I think people see it as an opportunity um, mm -hmm. to, to learn and to network as well with senior leaders that they wouldn't have normally have the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, with, with the BAME um, Black Nation Minority Ethnic Program, um, they haven't, they ha I haven't heard anyone kind of say, well, why, why are you trying to, and I do get that, why are we trying to fix me? Why am I going on the development program? Well, I guess it's making sure that we are, you know, those groups, you know, females, people from a, a black and minority ethnic are getting those opportunities that mm -hmm. we maybe would not have got, you, you, you don't get, exactly. Yeah. 
yeah yeah okay uh so you're you you would be in the let's do it category a, a group rather than let's not have those separate programs you, no you i i think they've been because i've, I've run two we, in the past two years with our females yeah and i see the feed the, the feedback that they give me afterwards is like you know it's they find it really beneficial yeah um okay. so i i think they're they're worthwhile having okay. um I don't think you should be forced to go on it. It's a choice. Um, but why would you not want to develop further, increase your, you know, increase your network uh, across the, the firm? So it's a great opportunity, really. Yeah. Let's let me uh, uh, launch the second poll here very briefly. Um, and that's looking at whether you have in your have organization. Two, three minutes left. So I don't know if there is. Time that went quick. <laughs> yeah, very quick. Very quickly, if you don't mind, Inga. Um, yeah, go on. So, so the, this poll is looking at whether you in your organization or the organization you previously worked at have any special programs that are being offered for people of BAME background. Um, um, meanwhile, Nadine, maybe you can answer the question in the chat then. How do you tackle intersectionality, um, different areas of privilege or lack of privilege where people overlap, which is sort of the Asian woman, uh, the Muslim man, the, yeah, uh, the Muslim older man, things like that, right? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. And I, and I think through the various, um, all the conversations that we're having, people are saying, you know, you, you really cannot just box people into a box. Yes, I'm black, I'm also a woman. Um, and it's just making sure that people are aware. And again, it's around the, the constant um, conversation, education that you can, you know, we're all individuals. Uh, and I think once people realize that, um, you know, we can start to be more inclusive. And, um, you know, the, the, as I said, I think it's through constant conversations the culture will hopefully start start to change and people can just be you know seen as an individual rather than you know black or a woman or etc cetera, etc cetera, so. yeah yeah exactly kind of like we're trying to do with gender um and those who are significantly younger than than me uh, don't have any problem with that to see the individual for who they are rather than uh put labels and uh, yes. or put them into boxes and, mm -hmm. and that is where we're moving towards although it's a slow progression so the poll results are up um so mm. the majority of um of you the audience don't have any special programs um in in place uh, but 20% do so that's that's quite interesting I think to see I think they are starting to gain popularity for across the board I know that more and more organizations are putting them on I, I I'm a little bit on the fence I have to say as to their um, e efficacy and it, it depends on the organization so obviously it works for Deloitte but I've seen them equally not work so well and in fact have the opposite uh, impact um, so yeah depends on um, uh, on your organization I suppose. Right, so we are out of time. Um, I just wanted before we close, and we do have a, a very short uh, poll for you for, for feedback, which we will not share the results of, and we'll run that in one second. So before people leave, uh, Nadine, what is your biggest uh, thing that you want people to take away from today's session? What is the one thing that they should remember if they forget everything else? I, I, I think you just need to just start the conversation. If you haven't already, that's where it begins and you must continue the conversation. Don't just let it be a one, you know, Black History Month and that's it. No, it needs to be all the time, every day, constantly, constantly. Yes, it might be annoying to some people. It's gotta be done. To, we've, gotta, we've gotta change. So yes, start, yeah. start the conversation. And don't be afraid of it. Don't be yeah. afraid. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, so we'll take a few minutes, a few moments for a poll. Thank you for um, uh, putting your votes in. Nadine, thanks again so much for joining us for taking your very, very busy uh, time out of uh, well, time out of your busy schedule to join Pleasure. us for an hour today. Um, we are going to conclude at the moment. Uh, but if those of you who want to ask some more questions, feel free to stick around. We're going to stay for probably another 10 minutes and we'll record it as well uh, so if you need to go don't worry you'll also get the next 10 minutes um, as part of the recording and thank you very much again Nadine
My pleasure, Rena. Yeah, it's super interesting to hear what uh, Deloitte's been doing. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, and hopefully uh, people have learned from it as well. Do Thanks, stop, everyone. Uh, yeah. uh, the submit button is not coming up on the feedback poll. So, oh, is it not? Uh, no, so you may not get a high. Uh, oh, yeah, because we don't. Oh, I see. Um, hmm. Yes, because we have votes coming in. Yeah, lots. So, I mean, we've got everyone who's still on the call has voted. So that's good. Yeah. OK, so let me open the that's all the votes in, Inga. Um, thank you very much for letting us know. Um, now, thank you also for staying. Uh, if you have any open questions uh, or questions for Nadine, feel free to unmute yourself um, and maybe yeah, raise your hand. There's a couple of questions that we didn't answer, so feel free to come in there, Peter. Uh, well, well, generally, I mean, it is, it is uh, very hard to get into the big four accounting companies. And uh, so uh, anybody that's got in there, uh, you know, it's like what we call in the corporate world the dream job. So, but there's a lot of people that don't get into the accounting companies and there's a lot of footfall out there in, with other organizations. Yeah. Is, sorry, was, is that a question? Uh, or? Well, it's, uh, you know, I, uh, Nadine, do you, do you think that actually it is hard to get a, a job in, in the blue chip accounting firms? They have literally tens of thousands of applicants, don't they? Yes, correct. Yes, we, we, you know, I think it's, you know, hundreds of thousands <laughs> of, of, applic of applications. Yes, it's, um, yes, Deloitte is um, a, a tough place to get into. I'm sure like the rest of the big four, but I think of myself and I'm like, I'm Nadine. I'm just Nadine. I got in here. I'm no one special. I mean, <laughs> so you can do it. I guess if you want to do it, you, you go, you, you do what you need to do to, to get there. Um, it's open to all, um, so so don't don't feel like you you know you couldn't try to get in. Just do your application, and that, that's what I did. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think you, people have this um, perception, mythical. You know, I, I can't work there, or I you know it's not for me. Um, but there are there's so many opportunities, different career paths. You know, such a huge organization, you know, like the other big four. So, so, so why not? Yeah. And, and have you changed at Deloitte? Have you changed any of your recruitment thresholds or practices to, to make sure, you know, looking at the data? Uh, and if you identified, for instance, that there is a barrier for a particular group in society that they cannot, um, pass for some reason has that been looked at in the data and then the process changed at all yeah so I mean we've done the whole blind CV etc but you know you still go to the interview you still got to see the person <laughs> face to face yeah. right After, um yeah. so it's around making sure that our, our panels are diverse where we can um so it's not just you know it's a mixture of individuals who are who are interviewing a person so things like that we are making those those changes to make sure that everybody has a, has a has a fair chance and to, to minimize any kind of unconscious bias. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any any other questions from anyone? Or is there anything in the chat, Inga? Yeah, just Fiona saying plenty of companies exist outside of the big four. Uh, yeah. Grant Torreson, we're also doing a huge <laughs> amount of B&I uh, from recruitment to development, retention and progression. So yeah, uh, feel free to, uh, which is a good point, right? Yeah, big four isn't the be all and end all. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other, anyone wants to come in? Are we, yep, yeah, all your questions being answered? <laughs> Venus here now. Uh, well, well, there are some doors opening. So for example, the uh, Oxbridge is now looking to um, get uh, undergraduates that are from ethnic minorities and they've got a, a special fast track uh, way in. Uh, but generally in the world of work, uh, unfortunately, you know, where you start is where, where you get. So if you've been to private school, you'll, they will normally guarantee to get you into a Russell University and then uh, the recruiters are using their milk round to to go to those universities 
I do remember a couple of schemes and they told me they only went to LSE, Cambridge, Oxford and Imperial College. And occasionally, if they wanted somebody from Scotland, they went to Edinburgh University. But, the, you know, there's about 55 other universities. Exactly. And that's what we're trying to do is to broaden out, not just focus on those universities. Yeah. I think that ties ties back, Peter, to to um, how important diversity is for an organization. And and if you if you don't want to diversify, and there are plenty of organizations that that haven't really caught on yet, um, and then they they won't they won't change their practices. Um, but what we Inga and I like to highlight are those that do, and to learn from them and from their success. And I think you're absolutely right. It's still a journey, and Adina always says we're still on that journey. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it has to it, it is doable and there are examples out there of, of things and initiatives that work well so um, th that that's what we have to hang on to not not the one the, the, the organizations who continue to do the same as they've done for centuries or, or decades at least um, but looking at those who um, uh, steam ahead into the future yeah and Fayola confirming that saying yes we are also no longer uh, look looking at those universities we have an active presence at Russell group universities and focus on those with higher proportions of ethnic minority students and those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds yeah we see a lot of the more top companies do that yeah. and it will be increasingly uh, yeah in the war for talent you, a lot of companies are forced to look wider is what i'm finding as well and yeah, obviously, if you look at under 18s, I believe, and I'm, I'm, there's over 20% of those are uh, Black, Asian or minority ethnic. So if you're excluding stuff, that's not the case when you look at 40 plus, still a small percentage. But when you're looking at over 20% of your graduate population that you're, you might be uh, not attractive for, then that becomes uh, yeah, something you're really missing out on. Yeah. So I think increasingly companies will be look, have to look at this. Yeah, it's yeah. it's Sarah Bonner here. So I haven't got my camera on. Um, Hello, Sarah. I, I would just like to make a point about this idea of looking broader than the Russell Group universities. There seems to be some kind of coding going on that you can't find the talent, you can't find good black people. So we're going to have to look beyond these more elite institutions and I think we have to be really careful that there is a lot of there are lots of talented people found within those spaces as well that just happen to not be white so I think there's and I hear companies talking about this quite a lot that we're going to go outside of this network to find ethnic talent and I think that's not necessarily helpful so I think we have to start make stop making that association between if we look more broadly we're going to find more black talent and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that but I think it has to not be used as code for there aren't talented people coming through those universities because yeah. mm -hmm. it seems to be used as an excuse not to do that and I think a lot of companies are now saying particularly um, Oxford and things like that they're saying we're relaxing the rules therefore we're going to attract more um, talent from black Asian minority ethnic backgrounds so again there's always this kind of whilst we're trying to be diverse inclusive um, within that there's still a form of racism that sits below that and I think that's something that really needs to be acknowledged and kind of kept an eye on it's a it's a very interesting point Sarah and thank you for sharing that um, because uh, I think the relaxing the rules element um, should apply to the criteria and the criteria doesn't necessarily measure a person's intellect and that's not what they're saying I think it's it's looking at the opportunities that people had to showcase whatever you know their volunteer uh, activities and other things that that maybe people of certain backgrounds would not have had to, uh, the opportunity to, to showcase in their background. And it's making sure that everybody, um, and not a particular, a very, very narrow um, type of individual can enter the, those uh, universities. So, so absolutely, I think when we're talking about relaxing criteria, it, it's, it's important to make sure that it's not just to, it, it doesn't send the wrong message, I think is what you're saying as well. Yeah, and I think like, I think lots of times there's this confusion between diversity and inclusion. So 
organizations can be diverse but not inclusive so you can have yeah. a, a broad array of people but if you're if not everybody is able to show up authentically and feel included and able to contribute and feel that they have equity then there's no point in being in a diverse organization because you're not having diverse decision makers so I would say that lots of companies are saying yes we're diverse but are they really diverse in the sense that how diverse is your board how diverse are your decision makers Makers, what are the voices being heard in that and I think there's a there's a difference between being performative and actually being authentic and uh, committing to that change mm -hmm. yeah. yeah absolutely and and, and 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 that's one of the reasons that I like what you've done at Deloitte and Adin uh, changing diversity and inclusion to respect and inclusion uh, with, with the with the underlying culture focusing on inclusion and tolerance and fairness and valuing that diversity and then making sure that that diversity that you do have uh, feels at home and feels exactly. that they belong. Yeah. So, so um, and that that's why, uh, I, you know, like you, Nadine, I don't think we're quite there yet, but what the things that you've implemented, in my experience, looking across other organization, uh, organizations is, is quite exemplary, actually. I know we're going to be out of time now, and I know Nadine, you've given so much of your time already. So I want to thank everyone for staying on, for asking more questions, for showing your interest. Uh, it's fantastic to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't get to say it in the main session, but Inga and I have a very exciting program uh, planned for 2021. We will be releasing it shortly. There will be. Uh, we will continue with the very popular expert interview sessions. Uh, we're going to change it slightly and that change will com be communicated to you but we are looking forward to welcoming everybody back um, after the holidays um, and Nadine we might even see you back here again if I have my way of course <laughs> you'll mind, be back Lena. I'm happy to be back if I wanted so yes oh well, thank, thank you Nadine and wishing everyone a great Christmas bye then yes all right thanks very much everybody see you soon take bye. care bye bye been throwing some people in the waiting room because they may never leave.